In this second video from War, Art and Visual Culture, Sydney, Professor Joanna Burke from Birkbeck University, London, gives the keynote speech. Burke is probably one of the best known living historians of war and has recently edited a volume called War and Art for Reaction Books. I hope you enjoy this session. It's my pleasure to introduce the very first of our keynotes, Joanna Burke. Joanna Burke is Professor of, Art, of History um, in the Department of History, Classics and Archaeology at Birkbeck College, where she's taught since 1992. And she's a fellow of the British Academy. Professor Burke is one of the world's leading historians on the social history of war and conflict. The books include What It Means to Be Human, uh, wounding the World, How Military Violence and War Games Invade Our World, and the Story of Pain from Prayers to Painkiller. The most recent edited volume is a survey of war art over the last two centuries, titled War and Art, published by Reaction Books London in 2017. One of her earlier books, An Intimate History of Killing from 1999, begins with the statement, the characteristic act of men at war is not dying, it is killing. It's a provocative, incisive, yet profoundly complex statement, which is why we've asked Joanna to join us as our first keynote today with a paper titled Cruel Visions, Reflections on Artists and Atrocities. So please join me in welcoming Professor Joanna Burke from Birkbeck University of London. And now the inevitable break one. <laughs> I am really, really thrilled um, to be here today. I was looking at the list of speakers and it was just amazing. I'm, I'm really excited about today, so thank you very much for coming. Uh, you know, there's this thing I always say that I live half my life in London, half my life in Greece. Well, in London, conferences started around 9.30, 10. In Greece, they started around 1.30, <laughs> Here, they started at 8.30. And I was just speaking to some of my Greek friends last night. They were saying, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very, very much for coming. I explained that it was the weather and all that. Um, uh, and thanks particularly to Kit and also the team for inviting me. It's really exciting. Um, war. Um, war hurts. When hurled into armed conflicts, the artists face the formidable challenge or brutal task of balancing the poetics of revelation against the aesthetics of destruction. Artists are, for, are forced to recognize that the body, their body, is no longer simply a subject good to think, but an object that is necessary to be. Artists commissioned by state authorities, media conglomerates, and other institutional agencies, such as museums and galleries, have the additional burden of creating a permanent and official record of what happened. Many are expected to offer visual slogans that will help civilians back home appreciate the experiences of their men and women in the war zones. They may even be expected to contribute to morale building. Although in moments of crisis, some artists do take up arms, and you know, note the passive tense and the metaphor, taking up arms, they are not usually perpetrators of violence. Rather, they encounter extreme cruelty and murder through acts of sense perception. Moralists repeatedly warn against conflating personal trauma with secondary witnessing. But I'm going to be arguing that we need to take, in fact, very seriously the idea that the sights, sounds, smells, taste, and touch of the wounded body can destroy worlds beyond the immediate victims. Whether embedded in a military unit or not, the artist at the center of war's carnage is unable to stand outside the spectacle of atrocity. Witnessing the suffering intrinsic to battle cannot be isolated from all other aspects of the artist's life. In other words, from that moment 
or sense perception, atrocities are interpreted through the lens of the artist's entire life story, including his or her infant attachment relations, adult interpersonal bonds, fleshly vulnerabilities, and cognitive frames. Not to mention, of course, the artist's personal exchanges with people in pain and their tormentors. As I'm going to be arguing in this talk, these processes are fundamentally embodied. As Maurice Merleau-Ponty insisted, to perceive is to render oneself present to something through the body. We don't have bodies, we are bodies. By this, he does not mean that we are nothing more or indeed less than physiological flesh. Rather, we are an indivisible mix of physiology, neurological poses, or pulses, autonomic arousal, cardiovascular responses, sensory motor actions, for example, affect, fear, hatred, happiness, the unconscious, projection, sublimation, and cognition, including, of course, ideology. This complex embodied artist is intrinsically interconnected to the other, including that other person's trauma. This talk, therefore, is an attempt to accentuate the role of embodiment in artistic constructions of the meaning, meanings of wartime atrocity. atrocities. The term embodiment that I'm using today draws inspiration from theorists who argue that people think via sensory motor experiences. In other words, our minds are embodied. In Raymond W. Gibbons, Gibbs' uh, evocative phase, cognition, is what happens when the body meets the world. I'm also going to be in this talk introducing the idea that empathy emerges as a capacity of imaginative embodiment. Now this, I think, is a departure from much, not all, but much of the literature. Historians of war art and many war artists of either sex often share a masculinist ethos which sidelines, ignores, or even denies the artist's body. At best, the, phys the fleshly physicality of the artist is viewed as nothing more than an instrument of imaginative agency. Attention tends to be focused on the artist as an aesthetically disembodied human subject. The artist's body is not only regarded as irrelevant to the production of images themselves, but also, and this is actually my most important, my crucial point, I think, um, uh, is um, to the body, artist's body is important to ethical decision making. I'm interested in um, embodied approach, approaches to the construction of artistic meaning and empathy in war. Basic bodily movements. Here I'm talking about agitated brush marks, broad strokes, thick scrapings of pigment, frenzied jabs provide forms of knowledge. They help to create and even connect the poetics of revelation and the aesthetics of destruction that I mentioned at the beginning <coughs> of this talk. As I hope to illustrate, this of course is not a universal or inextricable process, quite the opposite. Images emerge from bodily beings in the world and are always in creative flux. Now, the representation of war atrocities in art has generated a large and extremely productive uh, literature in the past few decades. Typical questions include, is it even possible to capture the horrors of war, let alone atrocities, in paint, pencil, crayon, celluloid, dyes digital technologies. Questions have also been raised about the aesthetics of cruelty. Is there a risk that visually representing a brutal act will reproduce its violent obscenity? Might viewers become immune to barbarian ways or worse, end up celebrating and death and openly fetishizing courage, gallantry, and honor? And isn't there the risk of repeating that great lie of war, that suffering is redemptive? These are important questions, none of which, of course, I can hope to even adequately approach uh, today. This talk has much more modest aim to look at such issues in just three contexts. First, affective performativity. Second, trauma. Third, empathy. 
as we'll see, I think these things are highly interrelated. In the next um, 25 minutes, I'm going to be looking at a small number, very small number of commissioned war artists, but I'm going to be giving particular attention to Peter Holson for no other reason than um, I think his work from the Bosnian conflict can best illustrate a number of my themes. Halson, for those of you who don't know, is a Scottish artist, age of 35, was chosen by the Imperial War Museum and the Times newspaper to serve as an embodied official war artist in Bosnia. From the start, he promised that he would not come back with sketches of still lives, but would get as close to the, fi as close to the fighting as possible. This comment was probably, I don't have evidence for this, but it's probably a snide uh, reference to the official war artists of the Falklands War, Linda Kitson, the first woman in the post, and she will also appear in my talk today. Other artists who will be mentioned include John Keane and David um, Rollins, both of whom were official war artists during the Gulf War. A few caveats. All, of course, of my official war artists, the British, there's nothing universal about their beings in the world. At the most, most basic, my arguments assume an outsider status for the artist whose non-traumatized home self moves towards armed conflict and back again, a luxury not open to most non-Western artists. Similarly, Halson is not representative of anything neither are the other artists I will be mentioning. My aim is simply to explore what happens when we think with ideas of embodiment and empathy in art. Theme one, affective performativity. This, this term, affective performativity, draws from three, three theoretical sources. First, the work of Louis Althusser for the ideas of interpolation, or the role of ideology as hailing the artist into racialized, gendered, sexualized, socially classed subject positions. Second, Judith Butler, who I see is um, informing a number of the papers uh, today, who argues that performativity is an identity that is always a doing or becoming, not a being. And finally, affect theory, which introduces this idea of the embodiment of the emotions. So the artist, in times of war, does the identity of war artists in negotiation with emotional, bodily, cognitive, and social worlds. At the very basic level, it matters whether their imaginative vision, bodily movements, cognitive processes, and engaged materiality, access to paints and canvas, for example, are categorized as art or not. Artists, of course, are initiated into aesthetic cultures from which they make choices. Take, for example, Paulson's admiration for Goya, Dix, Beckman, compared with David Rowland's fascination with more traditional battlefield artists of the 19th century. As the artist matures, family, friends, acquaintances, reviewers, agents, collectors, gallery owners, and audiences pay attention to some works and not to others. It makes a difference, of course, if the artist is a working class, class Scottish white male, Halson, or a white English woman from a very distinguished military and political family, Kitson. Nevertheless, and irrespective of the many ways in which a particular artist is interpolated or hailed, um, bodily comportment and emotional management need to be embedded or embodied to become second nature in the doing of the war artist. These modes of affective performativity are highly regulated for artists embedded within the armed forces. Um, embedded artists, of course, are tied to military structures, routines, and assignments. The nature of modern armed conflicts insurgent antagonists, IEDs, treacherous terrains, means that it's extremely difficult to approach current war zones without being embedded. As artists such as um, Gitto's 
um, here have noted embedded journalists and artists almost inevitably end up identifying strongly with members of their own military unit. Their every sensual facility, faculty becomes profoundly attuned to um, the hardships suffered by their comrades. The terrorists facing civilians or enemy combatants are muted in comparison. But of course, the pressure is not only exerted by the military, the institutions who commission these war artists, in Halson's case, the Times, have strong views about what they are paying for. Peter Stotter, Times editor, expected Halson to reinforce the Times commitment to the arts and add invaluably to the Times coverage of the war. So this bureaucratic, very pragmatic requirement was accompanied by an aesthetic one. Halson was to acknowledge not only war's traumas, but the heroism and dignity too. Commissioned war artists were expected to perform the emotions for audiences back home, encouraging through a kind of process of contagion the adoption of those emotions by civilians. Both Stohart and Holson agreed on the importance of this emotional transmission. Stothart lauded the artist's power to move. And prior to deployment, Holson himself admitted that the crunch was to see if you can produce work with the ability to move people. This bodily metaphor is rather <coughs> moving. I think it is very important, as we'll see when I come to defining empathy as a capacity of imaginative and active embodiment. Nevertheless, the war artist's set of partners remains crucial for the performance of art as artists capably of this process of emotionally moving people. Holson was aware of the need to maintain the tension between embeddedness and separateness. He noted that, as a civilian, he reacted really badly the first time I came into contact with something horrible, whereas all the soldiers had seen it before and, of necessity, could distance themselves from it. He admitted that perhaps the same would have happened to me had I spent more time there, but if it had, my ability to function as an artist would have been diminished. Official war artists had grappled with this tension before, intrinsic to many versions of affective performativity as war artist was this disjuncture between home front rhetoric and combat aesthetics. The home front rhetoric can be, or is exemplified, I think, by comments made by Times critic Alan Jackson and Scott Hart, both praised the Imperial War Museum and the Times for appointing Halson because of his ability to invest very ordinary men and women with something approaching heroic dignity. These comments draw attention to the problem in a stark fashion. After all, Holson's Bosnian art is anything but heroic. Indeed, these comments, their comments were made in, a book, in books that included, amongst other non-heroic, anti-heroic oil paintings, the one entitled Croatian and Muslim. Nothing could be further from heroic dignity than the scene of sexual assault. Two men press a woman's head into a toilet while one brutally rapes her. It's a domestic scene. One of the attackers steadies himself against a family portrait. In the doorway, someone watches. The painting is a repudiation of that distinction between home front rhetoric and combat aesthetics. The raped woman is at home at home that is worlds away from that of Jackson and Stothart. And the war artist's affective performativity, his agitated brush marks, stick scrapings of pigment, frenzied jabs, ultimately failed in their contagious function. People in those other, safer homes looked in horror at the image of rape and carnage, but were not moved to do anything except gape in shock and awe.
So the first tension is this disjunction between home front and combat aesthetics. The second is between sensory engagement with the armed forces versus immersion in battle. In the conventional reception of war art, status adheres to frontline combat exposed immersion. Official war artists could embody, embody three levels. The first inhabits the space behind the lines. <coughs> despite the fact that, arguably, <laughs> the most eminent British war artist of the 19th century was a woman, um, Elizabeth Thompson or Lady Butler, it remains the case that official war artists in inhabit a masculine persona. The first British woman to occupy the post, Linda Kitson, never got close to the fighting. The worst she experienced was extreme weather conditions. Because of her gender, she wasn't even allowed to travel to East Falkland on a royal uh, naval vessel. Her appointment gestured towards female equality, but actually reinforced sexism. And there's lots of examples of this, but I'll just give you one. In the foreword to Kitson, Kitson's visual diary published by the Imperial War Museum, so this is the official uh, booklet, Commander Dennis White patronizingly maintains that it was a privilege to give a little help to a brave, talented, and very determined young lady. Her artists focused on everyday activities, disproportionately um, emphasizing senior officers. At the second level are artists such as John Keane, appointed to the postal official war recorder during the Gulf War. Like Kitson, he arrived late and had limited exposure to actual fighting. His paintings, though, do um, evoke strong emotions, particularly those of fear. And here we, uh, we see ecstasy of fumbling. Keane's self-portrait of putting on his noddy suit, the protective gear, during a suspected gas attack. He looks terrified, confused. Pages torn from survive to fight are in the background. And in the bottom left-hand corner is a packet of agent, nerve agent pre-treatment tablets and a detection um, uh, paper for dangerous substances. The title of this uh, 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 painting, of course, a reference to Wilfred Owen's Dulce Decorum S. And the postcard of John Singer Sargent's famous 1919 painting, Gast, in the lower right-hand corner, subtly claim his status as at the heart, the very heart, of an authentic, masculine, and very English war culture. A highest level of authenticity were artists who were embedded with combat troops. Holson compared, comported himself quite <coughs> naturally as a um, authentic British combatant. He deliberately mimicked soldiers by wearing a uniform, having a number one hair crop, chain smoking, and never being seen without a hip flask full of scotch. His exposure to particularly intense fighting was always foregrounded in his account of his time at, in Bosnia, as were his encounters with death, as he described one scene of brains and intestines studded with fragments of bone and shrapnel being scraped off the ground by a shovel and the flies and the terrible, terrible, terrible smell. Artists as witnesses to frontline experiences, their ability, in other words, to say, I was there, this is the this is the truth, this is the truth, was what gave such paintings their um, authority. Of course, we as critics should not get um, embroiled in this authenticity debate with its kind of masculine, um, masculinist valoration of violence, both perpetrated and endured, as what maketh the man. But I think there's really interesting comparisons to be made between the different kinds of authenticity debates surrounding Keynes and Halson's art. In Keynes' case, his Mickey Mouse at the front, who generated this massive uproar. The oil painting shows a barricade seafront in Kuwait with dying palm trees, environmental catastrophe, a shopping trolley full of anti-aircraft rockets, aggressive American consumerism, a crushing, greasy 
flag and what many commentators, wrongly by the way, described as a grinning Mickey Mouse mouse squatting upon a plinth as if defecating an image of America. He was publicly rebuked for producing inauthentic art that was both anti-war and anti-American. Note, however, that when Halson's Croatian and Muslim painting um, was castigated for being inauthentic, it was for very different, and I'd like to suggest very revealing reasons. Now, many of you will be aware of the debate over um, Halsen's painting, but I'm just going to keep it short here. When Halsen's Bosnian paintings were exhibited in the Imperial War Museum in Flowers East in 1994, there was an uproar when it was revealed that the Imperial War Museum had decided against purchasing Croatian and Muslim. Instead, they chose to cleanse um, a painting about um, uh, Muslim refugees. But two, it was revealed, two of the five artistic record committee members, both the two women on that panel, had preferred Croatian and Muslim and argued for it, but had been overridden by their three male um, um, colleagues. The Imperial War Museum's Director General, Alan Borg, defended the decision by arguing that Halson had not witnessed the rapes first hand. Although Croatian and Muslim is a very strong painting, Borg argued, it is a work that could have been produced by any artist, any artist sitting in his studio. Now, um, naturally, this enraged Olsen. After all, he responded, half the collection in the Imperial War Museum consists of scenes not actually seen by the artist. The reason why artists are chosen to go to the war is to use their imagination. Otherwise, they could just send a photographer. Halson reminded his detractors that Picasso painted Guernica, the most famous war painting, without seeing the events, adding that although he had not witnessed some of the scenes in his paintings, the rapes, I could not have done them without going to Bosnia. So in other words, the very different critiques faced by Keane and Halson, I think, are revealing. Keane's inauthenticity lay in his assertion of Mickey Mouse amongst the war carnage. He was therefore castigated for being anti-war. In contrast, Halson's inclusion of a rape scene was considered inauthentic because he was not physically present during the rape of between 12,000 and 50,000 estimated victims. In other words, anti-Americanism was considered to be evidence of an anti-war stance Depicting the horrors of wartime rape was not rape naturalized as a kind of inevitable um, part of war. This leads me to my second theme, trauma. The artist's embodied encounters in the world, his or her kinesthetic engagement of the senses, affect, cognition, applies, of course, to all aspects of sentient life. However, the confrontation with violence, and especially in its extreme manifestations, hurls witnesses, whether participants or bystanders, into crisis. Now, I don't have time today to um, explore the variable and embodied ways that people respond to bad events, a term, by the way, I, I'm using advisedly um, in order to avoid the historically and culturally specific term trauma. I and other people in this room have written extensively about changes in the normative and effective performativity of people in the cauldron of combat. Shell shock, neurasthenia during the First World War, battle exhaustion, post-traumatic stress disorder during the Second World War in Vietnam. For the 1914-18 war in particular, war artists have immersed themselves in representing the emotional, bodily, cognitive, and social worlds of trauma in all its historically specific forms. This is not to say that all, or indeed even most, um, war artists depicted the horrors of war they painted in heaven. It is, however, to suggest that the, to suggest that the power of the so-called myth of war has had a major effect on subsequent war art. I think this myth is best exemplified by historian Samuel Heinz's characterization of the 1914-18 war. 
oh, myth as innocent young men, their heads full of high abstractions like honor, glory, and England, marching off to war in 1914 and becoming disillusioned. This myth has been especially powerful for commentators who saw themselves as artists, messengers. And here I'm thinking of artists like um, Paul Nash, who promised bitter truth and they burn their last souls. Anna Carden Coyne, David Morris, Tim Wilcox, exhibition, The Sensory War, expanded <coughs> on this dynamic in their transformative exhibition and uh, book of the same title. So this kind of war, in other words, required artists to visually represent the sounds of grenades detonating, the stench of high explosives, the metallic taste of blood, and the sight of human bone, muscle, tissue, skin, hair, fat strewn around. It required artists like Halson to listen to the stories of castration and brutalized children corrupted by violence. Um, and I think perhaps no painting of his represents this better um, than um, his depiction of children playing next to a castrated and crucified corpse. In this mode of war art, artists and their audiences scorned heroics, insisting on wounds. To paraphrase Elaine Scarrick, to see pain in war art is to have certainty, to see heroics is to have doubt. In this way, artists performed both the bitterness and the vulnerabilities of modern war. Now, as we would expect, there's major differences in the ways that trauma was embodied by artists from the First World War onwards. The first of these, and this is in shorthand, <laughs> the first of these um, shifts was the move from the shock of betrayal of the body, senses, and mind as a result of encounters with violent death, which led, of course, to the disillusionment trope um, expressed in the First World War art, to the belief that trauma was inevitable, the benchmark, indeed, of any true war experience. Holson expected, indeed, he planned to be traumatized. He believed that, and he makes lots of comments about trauma, but one comment was he believed that if you don't get the trauma, you don't get the art. It's all fear, really, the whole thing. The second shift relates not to the artists, but to their subjects, the victims of atrocity whose trauma is said to be outside of language and other representational modes of expression. Although this was an argument that emerged in the aftermath of the Holocaust, it became a standard trope of trauma theorists since the 1980s to refer to a vast range of bad experiences, including combat, mass killing, rape, disappearances, and pain. A large number of authors major authors have powerful artistic responses to this dilemma. And these are not, of course, the artists I look at. Lots of people have worked on these really brilliantly, really brilliantly. Official war artists, I think, are in a different position. Um, and they acknowledge, I'd like to argue, a different aesthetics. The body in pain that these official war artists um, may choose as his or her subject may seem to be buffeted by forces incalculable, um, uncontainable, yet that suffering is still capable of being communicated and recognized by witnesses. This struggle of representation, artistic representation, of course, is not without its pitfalls. Um, in their attempts to represent wartime atrocities, official war artists often proceed by accident. They may stumble in their attempts to communicate with others. They often seize on the nearest and most convenient metaphor. But they recognize that a painful, that painful, traumatized world is still a world meaning. In other words, trauma not without narrative. The artist can gain access to the traumatized worlds of other people through the engagement of his or her senses, including those of listening, seeing, smelling, tasting, and touching the vulnerable body. And I think this is one of the things that Halson was doing. 
of the rhetoric of inexpressibility, non-representability, can be ways of avoiding ethical engagement, death, major psychoses are beyond the reach of language and representation, but the vast majority of traumatized people still exist in the world. In other words, trauma is the suffering of survival. And finally, the third point, empathy. My talk today has been circling around questions about the inherent embodiment of consciousness. It leads me to the argument that the kinesthetic engagement of the senses is central to processes of empathetic engage identification. Um, as people here will probably know, the term empathy itself was introduced in 1873 by the German philosopher Robert Virchow. In his book on the optical sense of form, Virchow describes how when looking at an object of art, I entrust my individual life to the lifeless form just as I do with another living person. Only ostensibly do I remain the same, although the object remains an other. I seem merely to adapt and attach myself to it as one hand clasps the other, another, and yet I am complete, mysteriously transplanted and magically transformed into this other. From this I derive the notion of empathy. Now, Vicious Statement contains a kernel for my understanding of empathy as a capacity of both imaginative and active embodiment. Both imagination and action are central to um, uh, uh, the empathetic process. This is what distinguishes empathy from sympathy. The latter encourages viewers to project their own lived experience of sensation and emotion onto the other person or object, painting for example. But empathy does not presume that what is being felt into actually is what the other experienced or artist intended. It is always at the unattainable edge of imagination. It requires a fully embodied moving, a moving towards. Empathy is a capacity of both imaginative and active embodiment reaches to its reaches its uttermost limit in the face of atrocity. It hurts. It hurts to see, hear, smell, taste, and touch the vulnerable body of um, the vulnerable body, body of atrocious violence. This is where I suggest it's useful to look again at human responses to um, to horror. Uh, eminent scholars of visual culture and a kind of coin, Susan Bernal, are attentive to the lure of barbarity. There is an implicit distinction between empathetic aversion to broken, bare life and non-empathetic ensnarement to its horrors. In order to make sense of this paradox, in other words, sensual engagement with atrocity is tra traumatic but irresistible. I think there are at least two responses. First is to return to this older idea of mission. Here I'm not really referring to the artist as truth teller. Uh, Paul Nash's promise to tell the bitter truth may burn their lousy souls, but rather as someone whose engagement with the world can show what is invisible to everyone except the victim and her tormentor. And I believe this was what Halson meant in a response to criticisms about his Croatian and Muslim painting. He claimed that he did not intend to be controversial, adding that I was not aiming to do any of that Mickey Mouse stuff, a reference to Keane. Instead, he explained, I want to cut out all the reportage. It's not my job to do this, that my job is to do the things you don't see, that the army doesn't even get to see, not to be an illustrator, not to tell stories, but to produce strong images of things. Now his disavowal of telling stories evolves this kind of rejection of narrative. The woman whose head is being pushed down the toilet as she is being violated has had her story wiped. She has no name, no backstory. She is nothing, simply Muslim. That is her trauma, or part of her trauma. Halson's job, as he put it, was to show what could not be seen, the rape of a woman who looks skill at us. The second response conjures up the mimetic version of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis, in which trauma involves a compulsive return to the site of loss, a repetitive 
um, compulsion. And this relates to my definition of empathy as a capacity of imaginative and active embodiment. Howelson openly acknowledged that he was compulsively compelled to return to the scene of atrocity after he left it due to illness. This compulsion involved an active <coughs> form of empathetic identification because it required him to re-enter the scene of atrocity in order to help its victims. And he actually got very involved in helping uh, save some rape victims. Halson's creative acts fulfilled a similar function. In Croatian Muslim, Halson was not telling stories. He was not reporting any particular woman's um, life experience. He was acknowledging that no one, let alone the art and artist, can undo the wound already inflicted. But his art allowed him to work through the trauma of witnessing atrocity. Its, ex its exhibition in the Imperial War Museum enabled his personal melancholic wound to subside, or at least to morph into a more bearable form of mourning. Now, at the start of this talk, I observed that while it is important not to conflate personal trauma with secondary witnessing, the sights, sounds, tastes, touch of the wounded body can still destroy worlds beyond immediate victims. Viewers of the art of atrocity are being given permission to look, to stare, even, in ways that would destroy worlds if the suffering other was literally in front of them. In, uh, in this, my work is close to the work, or close to that, of um, Ariella Alzole, who argues that viewing a work of war art becomes a civic skill rather than a kind of aesthetic contemplation. This is not, of course, to say that there is any inevitable link between keen observation and embodied empathy. Too much evidence suggests the contrary. But by giving permission to stare at an image of terror, such art also gives permission to identify, to empathize, empathize to either look um, the Muslim in the eye or to watch voyeuristically from a distance, our choice. A very brief conclusion. Um, the three themes I've discussed today, affect of performativity, trauma and empathy, are interrelated. The responses involved in witnessing suffering emerge in negotiation with messy social worlds, including cognitive processes, affective practices, motivations, language games, etc. Meanings, history, learning, expectations, all influence the ways of witnessing war. Now, of course, my talk today, this is written just for this conference, uh, but actually it's a very long um, paper and it's ignored, my talk today has, of course, ignored a huge amount of um, issues. The two most important ones, I think, is I've ignored the gender analysis in this, we can talk about that. I've also, of course, cut the section that deals are with war artists who resolutely remain oblivious to atrocity, preferring to turn violence into a tempting melodrama or consumable um, um, uh, drama. One example here would be the official war artist, David Rowlands, whose website is strewn with words, and this is just on one page, glorious deeds, accurate, realistic record, dramatic effects, atmospheric, huge amount of research, eyewitness participation, um, desolute bravery, esprit de corps, adventures. Rather, my emphasis has been to point to the importance of what anthropologist uh, Thomas Sordas has called somatic modes of attention, or culturally elaborated ways of attending to and with one's body's body in surroundings that include the embodied presence of others. Artists such as Halson does this, I think, with his kinesthetic engagement with paint and brushwork. Viewers of his art are similarly invited to turn towards such art, bodily engaging with its subject. Thank you. Thank you very much. We probably actually have enough time for questions. Hi. Uh, thanks for that, I was uh, intrigued early on 
Right, the impression that you were referencing that that commission had taken place jointly by the uh, IWM and the Times newspaper, I guess having previously been involved in the commission in Australia, which requires a hard part of the circumstance under which that would happen here in collaboration with news of it. I was wondering if you would tell me just a little bit of background on what that relationship was and how it may have um, influenced that particular commission. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a, the Imperial War Museum is the, is the body that officially um, nominates the uh, official war artists. So what they did though is there was a, a lapse of time when they couldn't afford to uh, commission war artists. And the time, as I understand it, the Times editor actually was the one who approached the Imperial War Museum and said, look, um, we're willing to help with the financial costs. We think this will be really, really important for our paper and for communicating what is actually happening. At this stage, I mean, there were artists, of course, uh, working in Bosnia, including Bosnian artists, but their art did not, was not receiving a, a major attention. And, you know, the, the Times wanted to uh, basically boost their own sales by what they saw as um, you know, grabbing this opportunity in conjunction with the Imperial War Museum. I mean, both bodies uh, left Halson, as according to Halson's, um, uh, Halson said, left him really to do what he wanted. He got a complete free hand. There was no um, 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 formal restrictions on what he did, except, of course, which unit he could be embedded with and, and those sort of vague technical, practical things. But um, you know, they did give him a free hand. He actually went twice. He went once um, for a very short period and then became ill. Went back to Britain and you know the newspaper headlines were sort of coward, he can't cope, he can't, you know, psychological breakdown. In fact it was a yeah, he was ill. Um, and it was that response which actually was very um, disturbing for Halson himself. And and also he couldn't get it out of his mind. Um, he had endless nightmares, um, castration dreams, um, not dreams, castration nightmares, and all that. So he then went back um, again the second time. And with the times involved in the selection of the artists, were they sitting around the acquisitions um, table as well? No, Halson had total freedom of what he exhibited at the Imperial War Museum in the, in the major exhibition. He did hundreds of paintings. He was the one who chose which paintings would be chosen. The Imperial War Museum were um, able to, I think it was, they were able to buy up to, and I think it was 20,000 pounds worth of paintings. Uh, I think it's 20,000 pounds worth of paintings. And they chose the one of the refugees in the end as opposed to, to the real one. But it was very, it's very interesting the way they framed the, the museum, framed it because of course, it's a very um, powerful painting and very um, extremely violent and disturbing painting, but actually they just put it in a, in, a, in a room with other paintings with just a little sign saying, um, you know, there are some very disturbing images in this room. Was Dawson's work ever shown in Bosnia? Sorry? Was it ever exhibited in Bosnia? Ooh, I don't know. Um, not that I've seen, but um, that's not a no, that's just not that I've seen. That would be very interesting, yeah. They did, sorry, um, there were um, um, official um, representatives of the government who came to the Imperial War Museum opening um, and viewed it there and uh, were, were very uh, favorable towards it. But I'm not sure if it was ever um, taken there. I'd be surprised if not, but I don't know. Not that I see. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Joanna.